insurance. Gold and silver. Call 800 B U I C O I N. Michael It's one of the most incompetent contracts. Forget about deals from any standpoint. Whether you look at real estate, whether you look at war, whether it's one of the most incompetently drawn contracts I've ever seen. We could have had a much better deal. We could have had a much stronger deal. We should have doubled up the sanctions, negotiated for strength. We don't get anything. We're getting nothing from this deal. And then you look at certain countries who are opposed to it. Now, all of a sudden, out of the blue, they come, as an example, Saudi Arabia, they came back. Well, what are they getting? You know what we're giving them in terms of guarantees and weapons and money, probably? It's an embarrassment to our country. So that's Donald Trump vehemently opposed to Obama's throwing Israel to the, to the uh, Iranian wolves. And what's interesting to me is I'm giving you a little history of the Jewish people so we don't just start with today. We have to go backwards in time. And I brought you all the way back to ancient Babylon and the hilly rocks uh, of the area. And I'm not going to repeat myself, but I'm going to continue from where I left off and show you what I think and where we, where, we, where we should be thinking about Israel. Because many people are just looking at this from the point of view of realpolitik, which is that there are more Arabs, more Muslims, more money. Go with them. Who needs Israel? It's over. We did our best. They're a burden. Many people see it that way. Now, this is an interesting week. It's a very big week for the Jewish people who set the pace for most of the world to this day in terms of the calendar, whether you know it or not. Even if you're a Christian, you're following some of the rhythms of the ancient world in that it's back to school and the summer, beginning of autumn. Well, coincidentally, and probably coincidentally, it's also the Jewish New Year comes around this time, and it's coming this uh, next Monday, the 14th of September. And so the, the people who you know as the Jewish people, the calendar ends and it begins. A new calendar begins. The year 5,775 ends and begins the year 5,776. And I'm sure that Obama and the other Iranian fellow travelers in the White House would like to see this be amongst the last years of this calendar. Amongst the last... Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Today is an interesting day because the hater in Iran, the chief hater in Iran, who Obama's doing a deal with, said that the state of Israel will not exist, the nation, in 25 years, owing to what they're doing to Israel and the hate from the left in America and the West amongst liberals, Israel will cease to exist in 25 years. What's intriguing to me is that this in the Jewish calendar is the year 5,775. So they're saying basically the state of Israel, the nation of Israel will not exist after the year 6,000. Uh, It'll disappear. So, I'm sorry, 775 and 57. Yeah, right. 25 years, it's over. 25 years, it's over. Well, it could be Iran will disappear in 25 years if I keep it up. It's also possible the Mullahs will be tried for the war crimes in The Hague. It's possible that these monsters, these haters, these upsetters of world stability will be in in some international tribunal for the hatred they've espoused and continue to espouse without any consequences whatsoever. Anything's possible. We don't know what 25 years will bring. It could be in 25 years some of the leadership in America will be before an international tribunal for the damage they've done to the world and the hate that they've spewed. Could be in 25 years Hillary Clinton will be tried in an international court for causing the uh, dissolution of the Middle East with a failed policy known as the Arab Spring. Anything's possible in 25 years. We don't know. Now, I'm going to back up for a minute. There's no point in me trying to force others to see things my way because it's only going to make you even more determined to take an opposing viewpoint. All I'm going to do today is present you with the facts and let you make up your own minds, okay? So let me go back now to who the Jews were, and I'm not going to do it to the exclusion of everything else. And I left off with an ancient time in Israel, and in the ancient times, the ancient Jews were ruled, so far as there was any rule at the time, by priestly judges elected by the elders of the people. Selected, not elected. Selected by the elders of the people. The same way that our leaders are selected, not elected. As you well know, we have a closed system in America where we have a, 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 a phantom of democracy, but there is none. All of the leadership is selected by the leaders. 
And then what happened is around 1000 BC, they chose a king named Saul to lead them in battle. But Saul didn't do very good. He died under a hail of Philistine arrows at the Battle of Mount Gilboa. And his armor was taken into the temple of the Philistine Venus. His body was nailed to the walls of Bethshan. Following him was David, much more successful, a better politician. David gave the dawn to prosperity. And the only period of prosperity that the ancient Jews ever knew was under David. And that's because he was a good politician. He had a close alliance with the Phoenician city of Tyre, whose King Hiram was a very intelligent man who wanted to secure a trade route to the Red Sea through the Hebrew hill country. Normally, Phoenician trade went to the Red Sea through Egypt, but Egypt was in a state of disorder. And so Hiram established the closest relations both with David and with his son and successor, Solomon. I'm giving you a little history that many of you probably know or don't know. You say, well, what do I care about this? If you don't care about it, go turn on some rap artist. Go be an average American. Turn on some moron who dribbles basketballs right now, who has an interest in, in politics all of a sudden. An idiot who spent his whole life bouncing a ball on a wooden court is suddenly an expert in Iran and Donald Trump. Go, ahead, go listen to him. Or listen to John uh, whatever on, on television, who writes laugh, gets laugh lines written for them by people far smarter than them. Or you can listen to me. And I'll go on. So then Hiram wants the trade route. David gives it to him. And... Under the Hiram's auspices, the walls, palace, and temple of Jerusalem arose. And in return, Hiram built and launched his ships on the Red Sea. And there was great trade between north and south through Jerusalem. Solomon achieved the great prosperity and magnificence. He was even given a daughter of Pharaoh in marriage. Some of this comes back to you now from biblical class. And I remember... Remember this, it's important to keep the proportion of what I'm telling you in context. Because even at the climax of all of his glory, Solomon was only a little subordinate king in a tiny city. Let's not get carried away here. His power was so transitory that if, after a few years after his death, the first pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty had taken Jerusalem and looted most of its splendors. Just a few years after his death, the first pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty, name, he had a name, Shishak, took Jerusalem, looted most of its splendors. And so we move on. I'm not going to give you every little piece of history here, what happened, because the prosperity of the ancient Hebrews was short-lived. Hiram died. Hiram died. And then Egypt grew strong again. And then there was a history of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, which becomes a history of two small states ground up between first Syria and then Assyria and then Babylon to the north and Egypt to the south. It's a tale of, of disasters and deliverances that only delayed further disaster. That's the history of the Jewish people. It's a history of disaster. Always walking around with a cloud hanging over their head, which, I mean, I can now jump right to Hollywood and ask myself how in the heck could men like Harvey Weinstein and other supporters of Israel be so foolish as to support a man like Obama who wants the destruction of Israel? I don't understand how it's possible. Other than, if you want to make, make it very political, the reason guys like Weinstein and Katzenberg and Spielberg and Geffen support Obama to the detriment of Israel is because it's good for business. Because Obama has bought them off with movie credits tax credits, movie credits, and whatnot. And that's all that matters to them. It's all business. And they're smart enough to make billions of dollars and make movies that the whole world watches. They're smart enough to figure the script out, aren't they? So they know what they're doing. So like Zuckerberg. Why does Zuckerberg want America flooded with illegal aliens? Cheaper labor. That's all. There's not enough money for pigs. There's not enough money for pigs. Don't you understand that? Okay, now let's get back to the history. I'm trying to jump back and forth here. So what happens? What happens is eventually the Jews are kicked out again and sent to Babylon. And then in Babylon, the Jewish people got their history together and evolved their tradition. And then the people who were brought back to Jerusalem at the command of Cyrus 
were now a much more knowledgeable people. They had developed a whole civilization. And in the development of the ancient Hebrew civilization, there was a very great part played by certain men, a new type of man known as the prophets. And the prophets mark in the history of the world the appearance of new and remarkable forces in the development of human society. So who are the prophets? I have to go back at time to what's going on around the area in the Mediterranean and trade in the Semitic world. I have to talk about Spain, Sicily, Africa, Carthage. But I'm not going to do it now because it'll take forever. I told you earlier how Hiram cooperated with Solomon to build ships on the Red Sea for the Arabian and perhaps the Indian trade. Very important. But in the same time, in the same time, the Pharaoh Necho was a Phoenician. I'm sorry, in the, fa in the same time of the Pharaoh Necho, there was a Phoenician expedition which sailed completely around Africa. So bigger things were happening than what was happening in Israel. And at the same time, the Aryan peoples were still barbarians, living like cavemen. The Aryans were like cavemen. Only the Greeks were building a new civilization on the ruins of the one they had destroyed, just to give you some context. But around 800 BC, nobody on earth would have been able to prophesy that before the third century BC, every trace of Semitic dominion would be wiped out by Aryan speaking conquerors and that everywhere the Semitic peoples would be subjects or tributaries or scattered altogether. Everywhere except in the northern deserts of Arabia, where the Bedouin adhered steadily to the nomadic way of life. The ancient way of life of the Semites before Sargon, the first, etc. But remember this, the Arab Bedouin were never conquered by Aryan masters. The Arab Bedouin will never be conquered by anyone. So we have these civilized Semites beaten and overrun in these five centuries. And... Only one people held together and clung to their ancient traditions, and that was this small group of people called the Jews, who, as I said to you earlier, were sent back to build their city of Jerusalem by Cyrus the Persian. Remember, Cyrus was a Persian. Think about that. Just think about how advanced this world could be if we had one Persian today who was as intelligent and as benevolent and as far-seeing as, as Cyrus. We have medieval throwbacks running Iran. Because if we had men like Cyrus, we wouldn't even be having the problems we'd be having today. But we have no Cyrus in, his, in, in, in Iran. They were all run out of Iran. They're living in Marin County running shoe stores. So there is no Cyrus. So now we get to the Bible. They're able to uh, develop something, a literature, as I said, called the Bible. Now, many of you believe it's God's word. They developed it in Babylon. And people say it's not so much the Jews who made the Bible as the Bible which made the Jews. And what was the Bible? Ideas that were different from the ideas of the people around them. Very sustaining ideas. And the Jewish people have clung to them through 25 centuries of hardship and oppression. So what is the main idea of the Jewish people? That God was invisible and remote. He lived in a temple not made with hands. He was a Lord of righteousness that reigned over the earth. Remember, at the time, all other peoples had national gods embodied in images that lived in temples. And they believed if the image was smashed and the temple raised, then the god died out. But the Jews had had a new idea. The god of the Jews in the heavens, high above priests and sacrifices, could not be destroyed. And this God of Abraham, that the ancient Jews believed, had chosen them to be his peculiar people, not only to restore Jerusalem and make it the capital of righteousness in the world, and it gave the Jewish people a sense of exaltation. They had a sense of common destiny. And so this belief sustained them when they returned to Jerusalem after the captivity in Babylon. Don't you think it's a miracle that in their days of subjugation, don't you think in those days when they were subjugated by Babylonians and Syrians and the others and Phoenicians, I mean, they spoke practically the same language. They had almost the same, they had endless customs, habits, tastes, and traditions in common. 
Isn't it odd that they 